episode of Stories and Songs for you. Let me put my guitar down. I'm sitting here on a cold October day at the old home place, and I'm going to tell you a story today about a gorilla that escaped from a circus from a train that runs on a railroad track parallel to U.S. Highway 11 here. Ever so often, trains sometimes arrived with traveling revival shows that set up shop beside the tracks or circuses and fairs in the little towns along the way. There would be sideshow oddities, elephants and apes, fortune tellers and tigers, tall men on stilts and tightrope walkers. One spring, a traveling circus arrived at the foot of Lookout Mountain in the little mining town of Battelle. Their brightly colored railroad cars sidelined along the tracks, parading through the town in a grand parade of painted wagons with juggling clowns, prancing horses, and dancing girls. The circus crews set up their big tent with the help of the elephants who hoisted heavy support poles and riggings into place. When the tents were set up, the elephants grazed in nearby fields with a herd of cattle. The circus band rehearsed their songs out by the boxcars, and that night, promptly at 7 p.m., the gates inside the ticket booth opened, and a man started taking their hard-earned money. The bleachers were filled to groaning capacity as the band began to play, the circus master, dressed in a grand blue velvet suit and top hat, arrived in the center of the ring. He tipped his hat and shouted, Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the most amazing show you shall ever see. Above the sound of the music, the clowns came running into the ring, dressed in silly costumes, honking rubber horns and laughing while high above. In the rigging, the blue, beautiful trapeze artists swung and flipped from rope to rope high above their heads. Elephants moved around the ring as a lion jumped through a fiery hoop and then laid down in the center of the ring like a lazy house cat. There were trained dogs dressed in ballerina costumes and chimpanzees driving a small wagon pulled by a pony. Then a cage was brought out into the ring, and inside was a large gorilla. Wow. <laughs> Bosco stepped out of the cage, picking up one of the little folk dressed in a clown costume, and then another as they all balanced on his broad shoulders. He ran around the ring to the crowd's delight. When the act was done, and the little people were leading Bosco back to his cage, that great ape paused. He looked from the cage to the open doors of the tent. Bosco had made up his mind. With broad strides, he bolted away from his little keepers and bounded past the crowd into the bleachers, past the tall man and the barker, out into the night. The crowd, thinking that this was part of the act, cheered and applauded as Bosco left the tent. But among the circus crew, a great panic arose. I'm going to adjust this for myself. But the band stopped its playing. The little people and the barker raced out the door after the gorilla, followed by a man carrying a shotgun and one with two lanterns. Chaos broke out in the bleachers as the circus master called for calm. A great stampede ensued as the crowd bolted for the door knocking over the tall man and the bearded lady. Mm. The hunt for Bosco was on as people raced here and there. Women and frightened children screamed as they ran. Wagons careened away from the big top circus for the safety of their homes. But Bosco was long gone. Having crossed the railroad tracks and up the side of the ridge, he'd splashed into the creek and crossed it, headed for the tall trees on the mountain, where he climbed into an aged oak, balancing on a wide limb. Bosco sat and watched them hunt for him. He watched the lanterns bobbing here and there, and grunted as he 
saw what they were doing. He listened as they called to him as if he would answer. Bosco fell asleep in the tree, not paying them any mind whatsoever as they searched for him for days, alerting other communities that a great ape was on the loose until everyone knew. There were false reports of Bosco sightings here and there, and the hunt expanded. But Bosco was smart. He was still on the side of the mountain overlooking the tracks, and he only moved at night, sleeping away his days in those treetops, hidden in that thick foliage, grazing on the plentiful nuts and berries he found, fussing with the birds and grouchy squirrels at times, and drinking from the freshwater springs. He skirted the populated areas, occasionally coming near farms, stealing some garden vegetables and apples from trees when he could, but after a few days, curiosity took him to the top of the mountain. At the end of that summer, drawn by some enticing aroma, he heard music and he loved human food. He had sometimes been given cake and cookies by his trainer, and he knew that he smelled cookies now. At the edge of a wide clearing at the summit of the mountain, he crouched down beside a tree, peering out at a big house, its windows brightly lit in the dusk, and there were people moving around inside. Not too far away, a group of children sat on the grass singing songs while a man played a guitar. Bosco listened, pursing his lips and made a humming sound. He loved music. He raised his nose to the evening breeze and the aroma of the cookies was undeniable. Then he spied them, those warm cookies resting on a sheet balanced on the sill of an open window to cool. Bosco had to have those cookies. So he crept along the edge of the tree line until he was even with that window. He dropped down on all fours and quickly covered the clearing. He came to rest below the open window ledge. Carefully, cautiously, he raised his head and eyes above the ledge just inches from the cookies and eyed a woman inside the room. Her back was to the window. Bosco moved. He chipped the cookie sheet, grabbing up as many of those delectable morsels as he could carry. The tray fell back into the room with a loud clatter, and the cook turned just in time to see the long, hairy arm and fistful of cookies disappear into the darkness. She screamed, and she screamed again. She threw up her hands into the air and let out a piercing scream that alerted everyone to what she had seen. There's a monster, she cried. Her daughter and several of the guests came running just as she fell into a dead faint. It was a few minutes before she could tell them exactly what she'd seen and someone cried, well, that's that escaped circus ape, the one who came from the circus. A good distance away, Bosco paused to eat his bounty, savoring every morsel. He licked his huge hands and then moved on, heading toward the river before he climbed a tall tree and fell asleep again. Meanwhile, men gathered to form a search party. They brought dogs and guns and took off in every direction possible, but no one found him. He was sighted from time to time after that down at the tracks, a lonely figure perhaps waiting for the circus train to return. Annie had been seen along the river on warm days where he liked to lay in the sun. Bosco became the scapegoat. He was blamed for every theft of stolen vegetables, pies from windows, fruit on many occasions, and anything else that disappeared. But it was ten years later, on the banks of Little River, at the top of Lookout Mountain, that the mystery of whatever happened to Bosco was solved. There was very little standing room that day on the banks of the river as the crowd sang hymns in unison, their voices echoing off the rocks that Sunday when the Reverend John Peel waded down into the waters in his white robe with a Bible in one hand and Willie Bean in the other, holding him by the collar of one of his only good shirts, pulling him down into the water to be washed clean of his sins. 
Finding the current of the cold water, the reverend spoke in a loud voice, comparing the strong current of the water to sin, saying sin was an easy thing to get into, but harder to get out. And then he turned to his willing participant, holding the good book high in the air with one hand as he strong-armed the boy beneath the surface of the water with his other holding him down until he came up sputtering and choking, managing to shout, Amen, as he stumbled out of the water, climbing with the help of several onlookers onto the bank again. A woman joyfully stepped off the bank into the river after Willie Bean, moving toward the reverend, reaching out to him, letting him push her down into the water as he cried, Praise the Lord! Now, it could have been the sloshing of the water along the banks or the baptismal hole at Little River, or the fact that the bank of the baptismal hole had eroded in heavy winter floods, but it was a large portion of dark, loamy soil that gave way just then, and out of that soil came a skull, its gaping eyes sockets empty and blank, staring up toward the heavens as, as it bobbed and floated free. The reverend stared at the skull, wild-eyed, having just preached a sermon on the evils of the theory of evolution and how man could never have evolved from a monkey, he raised his free hand into the air, forgetting about the woman that he was holding under the water as she struggled and choked, rebuking the devil himself as the singing ceased. That big skull bobbed there in the edge of the water. One of the boys on the banks ran down and scooped it up, holding the large skull with both hands, as a gasp arose from the silent crowd. And when the woman broke free of the preacher and she saw the thing, she let out a scream and bolted from the water, running away through the trees. This was no ordinary skull. It would later be proven to belong to that gorilla, to poor Bosco, who had been caught by floodwaters in the spring that year and drowned. Before the moment, it proved to serve another purpose. With much debating, the topic of evolution at hand argued by everyone and every preacher, priest, and pundit from there to the wide Pacific Ocean just a few miles away. The great debate was taking place in Dayton, Tennessee in a court of law to determine the fate of a high school biology teacher who had dared to venture outside the theological bounds of creation. The deacon of the church dashed up and snatched the skull from the boy, dashing it to bits there on the rock, shouting, Get thee behind me, Satan! As the reverend rushed out of the water, raised both hands to the sky, and prayed with all of his might as other voices joined him. Lord, you have shown us here today during this holy day of baptism that the powers of the devil can be beaten, that he can be ground into the dirt like a piece of this unholy skull. Father, be with the prosecution in this heavenly appointed trial against the infidels and liars, people who say we crawled out from the ocean or came from an ape, or that the earth is millions of years old. For we know that you created this earth by the words of the book of Genesis, and we know them to be true, he concluded. So there you have the story of Bosco. And, uh, I'd like to have been in that crowd in the tent when he escaped. And I'd like to have been on the banks of the river when his skull came out of that dirt. But I'm going to play you the rest of the song I was playing at the beginning. It's called Lookout Mountain Blues. <laughs> See you soon.